Hi everyone. Sorry, after a bit of a delay, um, we're back with the next edition of our Lex in the Law podcast from Victoria University of Wellington's Law School. We're sitting um, in the Law Faculty Library. Um, it's a typical, beautiful spring day outside in Wellington. It's a joy to be alive, and the weather is reminding us of that today. Um, we're a bit snuggled next to an old fireplace, it has to be said. But what we thought we'd do for this um, reboot is that since the last Lex and Law podcast, there have obviously been elections, um, government formations, or in the case of the United States, it seems a lack of government formation. And what we thought would be really good to do is just to have a bit of a um, think about what might be happening in the law reform space over the next three years. Now we've got a government which is untrammeled, looking to be transformational, and so we're going to think of some things that can be transformational about in terms of the law reform agenda. Okay, so sitting with me today is Dr. Dean Knight, Associate Professor, and Dr. Nessa Lynch, also an Associate Professor at our law school. And I'm really pleased to note that our other usual contributor, Dr. Eddie Clark, is no longer a lecturer in law at Victoria University of Wellington, but is now a senior lecturer in law, which he always was a senior lecturer. <laughs> but now the university has officially recognised it. So we're really wrapped that he's been promoted in the last promotions round in this otherwise hideous year. We're very pleased with little crumbs of good news. So what we were hoping to do in this podcast is really to, revive, to, to look forward to what might happen in terms of law reform in Parliament. Now we have um, single-party government in New Zealand for the... Well, we can have a big debate about whether it's a single-party government or a multi-party government or by party government. We have a single government, ping pong government, which can do what it wants. What will it do in the law reform space? And just before we start off, and Dean's going to start off with um, some comments about d democratic infrastructure, I was just thinking a, a bit earlier today that, you know, would we start off by criticising the government for not actually having done very much in the last term, and it's been a bit of a trope that this wasn't a transformational government um, and the opposition obviously clearly challenged during the election that it hadn't really transformed anything. But just in that law reform space, sometimes we forget, because law reform isn't always at the front of our minds, and certainly over the last six or eight months in Wellington, it hasn't been in our front of our minds. Um, we've been more worried about COVID and um, pandemics and restrictions on freedoms and things. But there was actually quite a bit of what you might consider law reform. Um, the most obvious examples of those are the abortion law reform, which ultimately went through remarkably smoothly. You'd have to say that the government managed to shepherd through that, and I've always thought that one of the best ways of achieving law reform in New Zealand is to get the Prime Minister to make a bold statement about there will be reform on the following thing um, during an election campaign, because the Prime Minister always gets the reform that the Prime Minister wants. But I think that was done in a, in a crafty way. Um, there was Obviously, the End of Life Choices Act. Again, that's big law reform, although not done by the government, but certainly done by Parliament during the last year. There was a massive reform of the state sector um, legislation. Probably the most important piece of legislation in the last term actually was the state sector legislation. Dean's just on my right here, nodding vociferously, um, and laughing, chuckling. In case you didn't notice, that very important um, signature piece of legislation by Mr. By Mr. Hipkins. Mr. Hipkins also had a, a re-go at the Education Act. Um, there's important provisions changed in the Education Act. Probably from a law reform perspective a little bit disappointing in that it didn't actually go and redraft the whole suite of provisions in that Act. It was very much focused on the policy change the government had made and there's lots more to be done in the education law space obviously. But that's just a taster of some of the things that the government did so it wasn't as dull a term, and of course, the most important thing is I would tell everybody, <laughs> and Nettie knows what I'm going to say now, is that the government um, passed the Trust Act in a remarkable degree of unanimity. Um, Parliament agreed um, 121 to zero to pass the Trust Act, which I was um, happy to, very proud to have worked on when I was at the Law Commission. Um, so there has been some reform, but I think we're all in a space where we'd like to see a bit more reform. Um, Dean's going to give us a bit of a survey of what he's called democratic infrastructure. 
um, which again is an interesting thing. We're going to re talk about reforming in an MMP environment where, in fact, the government has all the votes it needs to do most stuff. It doesn't quite have the votes to change some of the electoral act provisions, but it can do lots of other things by itself. Dean? Yeah, I think there's quite a bit um, on the agenda for constitutional train spotters in this democratic infrastructure. Well, I'll talk about some of the election stuff, but there's some, also some, some other sort of integrity work and, and, and uh, accountability things in the pipeline too. But if we... we I think we've seen the headlines of um, lots of talk about uh, uh, looking at the term of Parliament and whether it should be extended to four years uh, from its current three, and that's something that's mentioned in the cooperation agreement between the Labour and the Greens on a matter on which Labour wanted to reach out on a cross party. And, and also there was a cooperation agreement between the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in a, in a debate. So. I agree, yeah, a meeting of minds <laughs> in one of the debates on that one. Um, and, and I think there will there's questions for us to talk about, about whether that, um, how that process works in the cold light of day. But but other things that are being signalled in that agreement were uh, the Electoral Commission recommendations on MMP from uh, 2012 and, and pursuing uh, those. So that's the reducing the uh, threshold uh, for entry into Parliament um, on the list from five to four, taking away the coattail rule, uh, re removing the overhang provisions, but also on important... I just wanted to just, tell, just remind everybody what the overhang provisions is. Many people can forget the centrality, the actual critical importance to our democracy of the overhang rule. Uh, Not this time, but it could have been decisive. Yeah, I mean, it's where one of the parties, now let me get this right, gets more electorate seats than their party entitlement would uh, entitle them to. So, so, um, so it was hypothesised during the last election that National might keep many of his electorate seats but have a very poor party vote performance. That's right. So it would end up disproportionate because it would have more electorate seats than it was strictly speaking titled. Yeah. As it turned out, in fact, its performance in the party vote was also reflective of its performance in the, in the electorates and vice versa. So rather than adding extra seats in the, in the House to, um, to accommodate those the extra electorate MPs, Electoral Commission made recommendations to remove that. The, the interesting one for me is the, the ratio between uh, list seats and electorate seats, which has always been a problem uh, because the number of um, size of electorate set by the size of the South Island, 16 I think it is, um, and we're getting more and more electric seats relative to the list seats, and that throws out the, the, the computations of the list seats a little bit out of whack. But, but we've had that report, and, and the government wants to get on with it. It was previously blocked or, or not picked up in previous parliaments, so there'll be a process around that. The other area they've signalled in the uh, cooperation agreement is reform of electoral finance, which I think will be a lot more vexed because this is on which there is a lot of difference of view about the appropriateness of regulation is, funding. So just to stop you on the vest, because the National Party stopped the Electoral um, Commission's report on MMP, what, two terms ago when it was in government? It basically refused particularly to progress the coattail provision. So is that likely to be more vexed than electoral finance, because actually the National Party has not wanted to do this in the past. And, and indeed the um, justice spokesperson who was in charge of rejecting that is now the leader of the opposition. So I think the difference is we've had an independent uh, expert body go through a process and present wise recommendations, and that, that means something in our system. I think we yet to see the, 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 the electoral finance have been subject to the same type of process. And of course the coat hanger, sorry, the coat hanger, the... The, the um, coattails, it's a bit, bit changed the new parliament because previously, of course, the Act Party was a major, was potentially a beneficiary of the, um, if it had got actually some more electoral votes, more, more list votes in previous elections of getting more seats. But, but now, of course, it's done, very, it's done potentially very well. Well, and the, and, the, and the challenge for the coattail rule is the fact that the party who's formerly um, benefited from the coattail rule, rule, rule is the Māori Party. Mm. And, there's a, and they've been the only one that I think, that's my understanding, where they've brought MPs in through this provision. I think they benefit informally through... Uh, the, the hope that people... The, yeah. Previous, the hope that, that people get someone's return in Epsom that they will bring in more MPs. Yeah. That didn't need to happen this time because, of course, right. ACT got to 8% anyway, so yeah, yeah, it, wouldn't yeah. have been, it wasn't an issue. Yeah, I mean, so... I mean, there's quite a bit in that elections um, election space 
I also think one of the things that people may have missed is that the, um, in the government response to the Select Committee inquiry into the last election, the government committed to rewriting, a complete rewriting electoral act over the next two terms, because I think they were realising the language of 1956 is no longer fit for purpose for regulating elections um, today. So uh, a programme of work there. The other thing lurking in the background is, of course, the Electoral Integrity Repeal Amendment Bill, the uh, Members Bill in the name of Nick Smith, which is to remove the, um, the so-called um, party-hopping, walker-jumping uh, 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 restrictions that were brought in last time. And that's one that's up for early action because, of course, like all bills, that, strictly speaking, will have lapsed at the um, end of the last parliament. And so it will be interesting to see what the Labour leader of the House, or Mr Hipkins, decides to do in terms of his motion. One assumes that he will revive all the bills that were pending in front of parliament when it was dissolved. That's not a necessary... Um, consequence. And, and in fact they didn't at the last parliament. I remember that there was some grumbling um, from some legislation not being reinstated. I think members' business from record was stuff that was um, directly against the, the platforms of the Labour and Green parties was not reinstated. Um, they said they just weren't going to pass it, so why reinstate it's it? Not, it's not really clear what the policy of the Labour Party yeah. is in relation to mm. so-called electoral integrity. We'll see, but we'll see early, early on with the reinstatement motion. Mm. Um, some of the other sort of things that I'm watching uh, in, in that sort of accountability rights uh, democratic uh, space, we've got the uh, New Zealand Bill of Rights Act Declaration and Inconsistency Bill. Um, uh, be, stands referred to the Privileges Committee. This is the bill that I, I doesn't actually codify declarations of inconsistency uh, as an available remedy. That's been done by the courts under the common law, but actually deals with how some of what Parliament must do in response to a declaration of inconsistency, but actually doesn't go that far in um, addressing it all because many of the uh, machinations about what happens in response to declaration of inconsistency are within the privileges of the House and the privileges committee is expected to come back and uh, uh, suggest some changes to standing orders about how they respond. So a very complicated and important constitutional provision which we're only see glimpses of but hopefully we can see that fully fleshed yeah. out in this term. And really, and, and exactly, I think we won't even see that fleshed out because I think it was the Minister of Justice that very early on in the last term gave quite an expansive speech about mm. reforming the New Zealand Constitution. Mm. Um, and I think many people got quite excited about, is he going to cross the, the Rubicon of um, Supreme Law again and all that stuff. That was rapidly ratcheted back um, to something which seems to me almost completely non-consequential, this um, very weak piece of legislation well, I think I think it is the nail in the coffin. I think for at least in, in for the um, Jeffrey Palmer and Andrew Butler Supreme codified complete constitution projects, the sort of dialogical model, this idea that the branches of government talk to each other and and and, and, and to avoid the great excesses is, is, is clearly David Parker's direction of travel on constitutional. But I think we'll see more of that sort of that sort of. Uh, that converse, <laughs> institutional conversations as being the way that we improve our, 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 our the way we do things, um, and the declaration of inconsistency is the key part of that. We've dealt with the judge side of what happens, how, how the judges speak. We haven't yet dealt with how Parliament speaks and responds. But to be fair, this bill essentially does pretty much nothing, and, and almost less than nothing, because uh, one of our colleagues has pointed out that there's a current mechanism under Part One A of the Human Rights Act which requires more active engagement from Parliament, and that is being scaled back to match what will be for the, for the Bill of Rights. So, this, so just, dear listeners, to, we are now engaged in a private <laughs> conversation, which we probably should just get flesh out so you might be able to understand what we're actually saying. So the Supreme Court of New Zealand has established that the courts can issue declarations of inconsistency or incompatibility when they say, when they find that a provision of a current statute would violate, or does violate, the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, but it can't strike it down. Now, the current bill recognises that thing and then 
says what, Dan? It says that the um, declaration must be uh, advised to Parliament. Mm. Uh, and and the, the, what that anticipates is it anticipates a parliamentary response. And, and, and of course, just sitting here, we are literally in the building between the Supreme Court <laughs> and <laughs> Parliament. It is a space of probably 100 metres. Yeah. So one could imagine that many parliamentarians would otherwise hear about a declaration of inconsistency from the Supreme Court um, without this procedure. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's political agenda setting. I mean, I'm not sure it's meaningless because it actually it creates a, a, a hook or an anchor for people to point to and requiring Parliament to do something. Parliament and the interesting thing is this one seems to require Parliament to do something. Some of us in our submissions suggested actually you should be prodding the government as well and that government and Parliament need to work in tandem with different bits of legislation. But the idea is it, 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 is it, it, is it sets an agenda and, and provokes response. Now you might say some of the responses may be a bit weak, some of them might be more, um, more sympathetic. I don't know. That's where the devil will be in but, the detail. But certainly it's a long way from the sort of Canadian notwithstanding clause where yeah. the Canadian Parliament has to directly override yeah. what the Supreme Court of Canada has said in relation to their Charter of Rights Freedom. Sorry, Eddie. Uh, just, I, I guess one's view of the effectiveness of this will be similar to one's view of the effectiveness of Section 7 of the Bill of Rights, which requires the Attorney General to report on potential breaches in pending legislation on, on bills. And... Um, Parliament, uh, I don't think, has taken up the opportunity of Section 7 to reflect on whether they're breaching rights, perhaps as, as uh, fulsomely as the drafters of that section no. would, have, would have wished. So we didn't see too many Section 7s last term, but we certainly saw quite a few Section 7s under the previous Attorney General, Chris Finlayson. But that, I would say, quite unfortunately, didn't stop the national government, for example, in proceeding with legislation which the Attorney General had said was a clear breach of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act. So is that... Oh, two, two more quick ones on the way out. Um, secondary legislation bill, one of the most important bits of reform we have seen in a general... Well, no, let's be honest. It was a big bit of legislation about dealing with the status of secondary legislation in terms of uh, publication and disallowance. And that's been a major um, work stream to review every empowering provision on the statute box and to, to clarify explicitly what is the status of the different secondary legislation for the purposes and, of publication. And in fact, that. I would say if there isn't, if there's a bill that New Zealand lawyers don't know about, that they ought to know about, it is a legislation yep. bill. This bill is quite radical in some ways. <laughs> radical because for the first time ever, when it passes, we will actually have a registry of legislative provisions in New Zealand, which Hallelujah. people will be able to find the law, because of, while we have a very good statutes we're part of the moment, it, there's no one repository of those instruments which have legislative effect. It's gonna be a great thing, but to, in order to achieve that, they've done this amazing thing, which is to go through and try and figure out which of the hundreds of thousands, I suspect, of provisions yeah. that empower officials you know, to do things, which of those are law, and they've made some really interesting judgment calls as part of that process. Well, and a lot of housekeeping. Interesting thing for me is, is is one of the things that they might want to go back and look at in the secondary legislation bill is the status of health orders under Section 70 of the Health Act, which <laughs> weren't included. <laughs> but, 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 um, so secondary legislation, other area of transparency, we had a commitment earlier this year for a review of the Official Information Act. Um, uh, but I think questions still about what that might look like, and um, and I think some people in the room may wonder about whether that's timely or not. Well, I, it's way overdue because I I was on the law commission when we recommended to the government in two, 2012 that there was a need for a modern statute, mm -hmm. um, and nothing happened to that. The only thing that happened was the last gov the last this government in the last term said they would have a review into the review. Um, which is a kind of frustrating thing when you've done the review to then have a review into that review. Um, you can argue that perhaps the Law Commission missed a couple of tricks in that review, and I think that the focus on modernising the legislation and dealing with some of the things like constitutional um, negotiation, things like that, we didn't, that, wasn't, that, that was good, it was housekeeping. What the Law Commission really failed, I think, and you could legitimately look at, is how you deal with the space of ministers um, by repute, obviously, not going to make any particular allegations in this podcast, 
ministers who refuse to take written briefings because they're afraid of information to, will, will likely be disclosed. Those sorts of issues um, are still permeate Wellington culture, and that's a difficult issue. The question really is, is that a legislative thing, something that's capable for the law to change, or are we better to, to, um, yeah, to do I, something else with practice? Yeah, I had a fantastic um, paper in one of my graduate uh, classes this year looking at the webs of accountability for compliance with the Official Information Act. And there's so many strings that you can pull in terms of management culture, the um, structure of the public service, consequences for managers, consequences for individual officials that make decisions, are there political consequences for ministers in interfering with, um, interfering with this? And there are problems, there are clearly problems that need to be fixed, but the degree to which all of these, or even most of them, can be fixed by legislative change to the Official Information Act is, I think, limited. I think there are changes that need to be made to the legislation. It's, um, the principles, I think, are fundamentally sound, but it's the drafting is um, creaky. It's a 1982 statute, and it's not written the way that we would write a statute these days. It's not particularly user-friendly. Some things need to change, um, but it also requires wider reflection on what we want government to look like. And it seemed to me the most important change for the Information Act was having a much more activist, activist ombudsman who was prepared mm. to both be quite um, forthright in particular cases, but perhaps more importantly was more proactive in trying to force government departments into a, a, an active programme of trying to figure out what information they should be releasing. Yeah, and we get... We get um Together with the State Services Commissioner, they've done quite good work on doing audits of, preemptive audits of different parts of government and seeing how their compliance is and what their information culture is like, what the training practices within the, the uh, department are like. Um, and it's positive signs, um, but it's sort of green shoots rather than giant trees. Um, more stuff is needed. Right, so thanks, Dean, for the democratic infrastructure. Now, Ness has just been sitting to my left. Um, so are there green shoots in the world of youth justice, Nessa? Um, thanks, Jeff. Well, I think I'd speak more generally about the criminal justice context. Um, so I know Eddie's going to pick up on some of those matters, um, which I suppose were stymied by New Zealand first. Um, but obviously, criminal justice reform in the early months of the previous government and so there were some quite broad statements made about reducing imprisonment and transformational change in the criminal justice system. So we certainly had a lot of really, um, I think, reflective and, and really deep thinking from the advisory groups. We had a number of summits and HUI. We had a couple of really fantastic reports on criminal justice, but obviously we didn't have any concrete change in terms of legislation um, or major policy changes. Um, so what I'm going to suggest um, are probably two fairly quick and easy legislative changes that could be made in youth justice and, and the adult justice system. And because I think we'll all recognise that long-term criminal justice change is, is difficult, it's really complex, um, it involves transformational change, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and and some, I think some of this work is beginning. But what I'm going to, I think, pick up on is some legislative levers. Um, so firstly, in, in the youth justice um, area, so what I want to just speak briefly about are what are some of the really hard cases. And um, so where I'm from in Cork, a hard case means a kind of a tough person as well. So it probably has a, a double meaning. But um, I'd like to see us introduce some legislative change for those really difficult cases. Um, so at the moment, I think we do quite well with a lot of our youth justice, which is dealt with through discretionary, through police, through diversionary. Um, but what we're doing is still bringing some of the really serious cases um, to court, some quite young children and young people. Um, and also our very serious end, um, we are bringing young people into some really punitive adult justice systems, which people from overseas find quite surprising. Um, so I'm going to be working on this 
over the summer with some colleagues, so watch this space. But what I would suggest is that it would be relatively easy to make a couple of legislative tweaks and affect some real change here. So I'd like to see the age of criminal responsibility um, go from its current age of 10, which I think most people would find quite surprising, um, to the age of 12. I think that could be done quite easily. Um, and the other thing I'd like to see is all young people within the jurisdiction of the youth court. So at the moment, we've got most young people, um, but we don't have all 17 year olds. And when our young people commit really serious offences, um, such as murder and manslaughter, we essentially evict them from our specialised youth justice system into our adult justice system. Um, so some other jurisdictions, Canada, Western Australia, what they do is they go by age. So whatever the child or young person has done, they're in the youth court. And that works really well in terms of having your specialised staff, your specialised judges, your specialised procedure. But it also works well for victims of crime. And um, so that much more participatory um, and more informal process actually works really well for victims as well. But yes, if that's so obvious, it seems obvious, why doesn't it happen in New Zealand? Because we've had lots of conversations about hmm. dealing with these things in a more appropriate, systematic way, yeah. but we've still got the situation where, as you've said, young people, some very young people, seem to be evicted from the system of justice which is designed to deal with those young people. Um, so what I would suggest, um, and I've written about this in some of my own work and some collaborative work, is that sometimes these young people don't fit our narrative of reform, so we like to, as as advocates and scholars say, you know, most young people commit really minor offences, um, they're easily rehabilitated, and some of these young people don't fit our narrative, um, and they are quite difficult. Because literally some of these people have committed murder, like we all yeah. aware that high profile cases of these kids have committed murder, yeah. and seem to have been engaged in lots of bad stuff as well around mm -hmm. those murders. And I think they sometimes, it's a little bit easier to, to kind of forget about them, but I think that these are relatively easy changes. The other thing I'd like to see is um, probably a prohibition or a really strong presumption against the use of life imprisonment for children and young people. Because um, at the moment, if you're sentenced for a murder, it doesn't matter whether you're 11 or whether you're 45 or whether you're 70, um, the same law applies. So there's a presumption of life imprisonment. So we do have some pretty young, young people serving a life sentence. And is that including the presumption, the, the semi-presumption that everybody gets seven, the 17 year presumption? Um, so what we have in New Zealand is we do have a, a safety valve, as it were, of manifest injustice. Um, so there's only one case since 2002 where a child, um, a 13 year old, um, the, the case of Nelson, um, escaped the life imprisonment under the manifest injustice. But judges seem a lot less keen to use the the 17 year presumption for the aggravated murder so i think there's only one of them that has been used for an under 17. Um, so they're in the 10 to 17 zone yeah 10 to 17 zone but remember that's just the minimum non-parole period so um i do keep an eye on those parole decisions as they come up and they don't it's it's not regular that you would immediately get parole after your minimum period um so i think that's quite out of filter with other jurisdictions. It's, it's what's happening to these very young kids who are convicted of these serious offences. They're not being held in preliminary by one presumes. Um, well, that is another issue. I think we've done a lot better in recent years um, in using the Orana Tamariki residences. So there's an agreement between corrections and OT where um, an under 18 is subject to a prison sentence where they will be under corrections custody but in the OT residence. Um, but once they age out of that, they're going into an adult prison. And, and we do have under 18s in, in adult prisons here in New Zealand, especially for young women because um, the numbers of young women are very, very small. Um, so whereas there's youth units attached to two prisons for young men, um, because the number of young women is very small, um, there isn't the business case as a model for separate, so they just go into the general population. Um, so again, these are a small number of cases which I think could be quite easily accommodated within the existing um, system. Um, and I think the other thing which will probably segue quite nicely into to, um, Eddie's commentary is around the three strikes. And um, so obviously we, we were on the point of getting rid of this apparently in the last government where um, uh, New Zealand first put the brake on it. But I think there's, there's general agreement um, that the three strikes 
uh, should be uh, struck out, as it were. Um, so because it really doesn't fit with our model of proportionate sentencing, so um, we have this idea, obviously, that the, the sentence, you apply the principles under the Sentencing Act, um, and that it's proportionate to the harm and wrong in the crime. And when we use three strikes, as we've discussed in previous podcasts, we're essentially having a mismatch. So, so the guy who was it petted a woman on the bottom, which he shouldn't have done, and in a decent assault, he was in theory he was up for I think seven years. He was going to yeah. get seven years because of his previous convictions for um, for. Um, yeah, because of the ratchet effect yeah. of the of the. So obviously, we've seen. I think we discussed this in a previous edition that the judges have been really stringent in applying the manifest injustice exception. So we haven't had to date anyone who's um, apart from uh, one person who's been uh, the, the Christchurch mosque shooter who's received the non-parole sentence. So judges have been doing that tempering of the punitive potential. But I think three strikes could be quite easily and quickly. Would you- which is probably indicative of a very bad law reform that didn't actually achieve what mm. the people who wanted it to achieve because of the way it was written and the fact that it was so overblown. That there's always a natural push me, pull you effect in these kind mm. of law reforms. If you push judges too far in one direction, they will pull back in the other. And it seems that the three strikes just didn't achieve that. And, mm. you know, I think New Zealand really does need meaningful sentencing reform, but that just wasn't it. Yeah. And people that go on about that need to really deal with the realities that these kind of disproportionate cases are what judges are going to have in their minds and they're going to really stop the, if you do believe in hardline sentencing policy, going to stop you achieving what your aim is. Yeah. Um, so again, I think those are, there are a lot of long-term transformational policy funding principled things that we need to do in the criminal justice system, but I think there's very little reason, resourcing included, um, that particularly that youth justice stuff couldn't be done because it's it's not about completely stopping um, these type of, of responses. It's about just moving them into a more appropriate jurisdiction. Um, so the resourcing implications, it's a small number. It shouldn't be huge. The infrastructure is there. The youth court um, has been seeing dropping numbers. Um, so I think it's, it's quite possible. You don't think the politics would just stop this thing? Because old people will point at these murderers, that these little these kids who have murdered, and they'll point out at the brutality these children have displayed, mm. and the criminal nature of their enterprises, which led to the murders. Mm. Do you think the politics will st- prevent that from happening? Well, what it is, I think, is it's not a zero sum game where you say we're not going to hold them accountable at all. It's about age appropriate accountability, and I think people do understand that that we have. You know, if your child is sick, you go to a paediatrician, you have them in school, we've got restrictions on working, and um, that we do have an age-appropriate way of, of... But I suppose that looks at criminality as almost like a sick and to the paediatrician analysis, something's wrong with you, whereas I think that a lot of people with those serious crimes say, well, yes, something is wrong for this kid, mm. they just need to be locked away, this, we need to be very retributive t- towards this child. They're no good. They're evil, basically. But what I would say is, if you put, if you're putting a 14 year old in prison for say 10 years, they're going to spend a lot of their life out in the community. And I would certainly prefer, as a member of the public, that that person is reintegrated. And I think what we've seen in the manslaughter cases, where judges have a lot more discretion, much more of a tailoring of the sentence towards that eventual goal of reintegration and public safety, whereas the more mandatory, restricted regime for murder. Essentially, you can see the judges don't want to apply the sentence, but they find themselves bound by the law. So the goal, I think, for everybody is that reintegrative response. Um, and the more that we understand about brain development and kind of the temporal maturation of, of the brain, um, we should be applying this to this. But I don't rule out the possibility that there are some cases which require a very, very long sentence, but I would like to see it much more... Um, I suppose akin to some more um, mental health legislation that we go a bit more on risk rather than punitiveness for young people and say that there are probably some young people that are quite safe to leave back out in the community after a number of years. There are others who are going to need a longer time frame. Um, but the the changing and the maturation of a young person's brain, I think, is a lot different to an adult's. So that might segue nicely into you, Eddie, when we when we talk about the three strikes and the possible break that New Zealand first had on various projects. Yeah, so I think Eddie's got a list of three things. He <laughs> thinks the absence of New Zealand first from both the government and 
from the house. The house <laughs> might mean we should expect some progress on or a different well, debate, more f- a faster debate or a better debate. Allegedly, at least, and it will be it will be really interesting to see this term, the matters that implicitly or explicitly the other governing parties blamed on New Zealand First for not happening. Those two parties are both in one form or other in the current government. So let's see if all the things that they said were New Zealand's first fault for not happening in fact happen in the next term. And two of those that I'd be interested in seeing progress, um, and one at least would be very, very simple to progress because it's halfway through the legislative process, um, are a review of the uh, hate speech provisions to the extent that they exist in New Zealand uh, already, uh, and changes to the process for altering your birth certificate to match your gender. Um, And on the hate speech review, this... it was almost a, a dead letter in New Zealand until after the Christchurch shootings. This wasn't something that anyone was really thinking about, but this got people focused on the danger and the harm that can be caused by vilification and dehumanisation of, of different groups. Uh, and very quickly after that, the Minister of Justice, um, who was Andrew Little at the time, announced that they were going to review the provisions and, and try and do something with it. Um, almost two years later now, nothing has, has appeared. Um, and I think part of that was nervousness on the part of New Zealand First, and part of it was also nervousness about putting this sort of thing out um, in the run-up to an election. Um, both of those things are gone now. But we're always in the run-up to an election. Well, that's <laughs> right. But, but Four-year terms. My, <laughs> my, my understanding is that most of the policy work for a discussion paper has been done, so we should get something on this soon and I think it's worth reflecting on why we might need these changes so I just want to briefly talk about to the extent that we have them what are the hate speech provisions that we have in New Zealand and the reason I say to the extent that we have them is that under the Human Rights Act there are provisions saying that you are not allowed to incite racial disharmony so it doesn't use the term hate speech Uh, it's like hate crime which is a separate thing we don't have that in New Zealand. Instead, we have aggravating factors under the Sentencing Act. So we don't use that language, but what this offence is, um, and it appears twice, interestingly, in two different contexts in the Human Rights Act, is words or actions are likely to excite hostility against or bring into contempt any group of persons in or who might be coming to New Zealand. So that would cover, for example, refugees from a particular country, because they may be coming to New Zealand on the ground of colour, race, uh, ethnic or national origins. Um, And in part two of the Human Rights Act, that's the normal provisions about the Human Rights Commission, that means you can make a complaint to the Human Rights Commission if someone does that. And that triggers the normal Human Rights Commission non-punitive processes. It's a dispute resolution process. It's mediation. You talk through that and try and resolve the issues. And if you can't resolve that, it can be referred on to the Human Rights Review Tribunal, which can impose various civil penalties, including uh, a fine, but it can't criminally convict. There's no criminal sanction attached to that. But there is also a criminal version of this that is almost word for word the same. The addition being it requires intent to encourage racial disharmony, vilification, etc. And That is a criminal provision, but there's an extra hurdle there, which is it requires the Attorney General's consent to proceed with prosecution under that, Uh, and we have had a grand total of, um, since this Act and its predecessor, um, which was passed in the 70s, have existed, there has been one prosecution, criminal prosecution, under this provision. And why do we do that? Because we value free speech. We, We think that you need to have a really high bar before we're going to interfere with your ability to say what's on your mind to hold particular views. Um, And it's a really difficult conversation to have about we've seen the sort of harm that can happen to society and to groups in society when vilification is allowed to happen unrestricted. But we've also seen in other societies what happens when you screw down too tightly on the things that people are allowed to say. 
So I don't think that this is an easy question, and I think it's right that the government has taken quite a long time to consider what we should be doing with this, and we as the public should be given an opportunity to have a serious say in a proper consultation process. What chance of consensus on that, though, Eddie? Like, no. Um, there's no chance of consensus, but I don't think that that means... Or consensus meaning most people will think what the government's going to do is OK. There's always going to, there's clearly going to be a group of people who are very, they would say, very pro-free speech people who will always oppose yes. anything, any reform. But for most, do you think there's a possible reform here that basically will have reasonable political spectrum support? Yeah, the, I don't think there's no fish hooks in this approach, but I think probably the, the thing that seems obvious to me is that we have a dozen or so, a little over a dozen grounds of, of discrimination in the Human Rights Act, and most of those are not covered by the, the um, disharmony provisions. So if someone was trying to, and we've seen terror attacks based on misogyny overseas, if someone was um, indulged in extreme misogynist rhetoric, that wouldn't be covered by the current provisions. If someone was involved in uh, extreme anti-Christian uh, sentiment, that would not be covered. Um, so an extension to the grounds while retaining this basic structure is one reform you can look at. The other question is what the relative roles of civil and criminal penalties you want. Uh, some jurisdictions have completely got rid of any civil penalties and have a very high threshold to breach, but if you breach it, it is a criminal offence and that's the only thing it can be. Others uh, have the structure that we have, which is for extreme events there's criminal processes, uh, but there's the civil dispute resolution process for the rest. So do we have a sense of what the government's going to do in the discussion? For any sense, are they going to have a preferred approach or are they just going to put all these issues out like you've just done? I, I would expect, um, and I have no special knowledge of this, I've not talked to anyone in, in government, I would suspect what they're going to do is suggest that we expand um, the current provisions based on other grounds of, of, of discrimination. And there are problems with that because some of the grounds don't seem to fit neatly particularly something like political opinion. Um, you could say that people that have extremist, racist views, that that is a uh, political opinion, therefore criticising that is vilifying um, someone on a prohibited ground and, and you can take them to the Human Rights Commission. So, like I said, I don't think that this is an easy question, but it's clearly something that I don't think we have quite right yet and needs some consideration and some legislative act action in the next term. Um, so that's sort of quite a serious fundamental rethink of how we think about free speech and how we think about how we make sure people belong in the society that we live in. Um, and in a more limited form, that's, that's also what the, the second um, piece I want to talk about is about how we make sure that people feel safe and, and secure living in our society um, is this regime for altering birth certificates. Um, and this proceeded, this was a slightly odd process. It proceeded a couple of years ago now um, to the second reading, the Birth, Deaths and Marriages um, reorganisation. It's, it's a broader reorganisation of the way that we register birth, deaths and marriages, um, largely banal and sort of about as, as dull as you can get. Government Administration Committee, the world's dullest select committee, sorry members of the Government <laughs> Administration Committee. Um, but one thing that came up in submissions at select committee stage was this should allow for transgender people to uh, change their birth certificate to match their, the gender that they live in. And that's currently possible, but it requires a process involving a family court judge, medical evidence, um, and uh, quite a lot of hoops to jump through that can be quite expensive and quite intrusive. And what uh, advocates for the transgender community and ultimately the committee recommended this change uh, when it reported the bill back uh, was to allow it to be done essentially via a statutory declaration. Um, and there was some uh, quite loud displeasure about this change um, from some uh, sections of the feminist community, 
not all by any means, but some, uh, and some discomfort from the minister responsible, Tracy Martin, and the bill got pulled halfway through. And they said, we'll go back and look at this and maybe do some more consultation and bring it back. And it has never been brought back. So it's still on the, but it's still on the water paper. It's still on the water paper as far as I'm aware. So it's not quite pulled, it's just nothing happened to it. It's in the same status as the Kermadec yes. um, Marine Sanctuary Bill. Yeah. Um, so it, it's in limbo and I would like to see it brought back from limbo. And the reason I say this, and I think it should be cha- uh, passed essentially without changes to, to what the committee recommended. The reason I say this is the things that will change on a substantive basis for anyone who is not transgender are vanishingly small. So I, again, I've been very lucky with my students this year. I had a really good student research paper on this. Things that uh, the objectors were worried about were things like uh, people being sent to a prison, uh, transgender women being sent to a women's prison, um, competition in, in sports, fairness and parity on that, who can access a women's shelter, um, how the census records gender, all of these sorts of things. And without going into the, the merits of whether those worries are substantial or not, none of them, zero of those, is determined by one's birth certificate. That's not what determines what, for those purposes, we count someone's gender as. So it can't have the effects that people were raising as red flags or things that were scary. It just doesn't have that effect. And some of the documents that are used to determine those things, driver's licenses and passports, have been allowed to be changed based on statutory declaration for a number of years now. So it's it's the birth certificates that are out of whack here. On the other, on the other side, there's a process problem here, isn't there, really, that the bill came in with one procedure. And this is one of the situations where you can argue it's clearly within the scope of the bill to change these provisions, these, bill, these provisions are altering what's in the bill. But you can argue here the Sphere Committee has done something different. And the real question then is, is there a process issue of whether we should go round, round the merry-go-round, if you like, in the Sphere Committee again, so that people can vent their objections if they have objections? So my parliamentary process um, now isn't, isn't um, brushed up enough to know if you can resend a second reading bill back to a select committee. Um, but if one can, there may be some merit in that. The, my concern is that there's been some quite nasty um, abusive rhetoric towards transgender people in relation to this bill, and I would be worried if that this may be an opportunity for that to happen again. Um, but we also need to give New Zealanders some credit uh, and say that this is something that it's worth talking about and, and having a conversation about. Um, so if that's something that can be done, I don't see that there's any real reason not to do that. Um, yeah, but, I, but I don't necessarily think it would actually... I, I don't think the objectors want to be consulted. I think they want it to not happen. But that's also part of this... Um, for, part of the select committee, isn't it? People being able to turn up and... Say, I don't want this to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's our sort of pop brief from our three presenters. I was going to talk... I think we've sort of a bit out of time and we've already indulged our picadillos longer than you probably have listening tolerance, (laughs) but just a couple of um, other things to watch out in in the sort of dry as dust law reform areas. Um, Just check before the Incorporated Societies um, Bill, which has been a a, a, a goer in terms of an exposure draft for the last four years. There is actually a bill, it is drafted, it is ready to be introduced, um, and it wasn't introduced in the last government, last term of the government. There were some changes made. The current website status is affected by COVID. <laughs> um, hopefully that can get in. There's lots of organisations in New Zealand that need that statute. I can say that as someone who was very involved in the Law Commission report. And just, again, and we might do a different podcast on extradition and the problems with the current extradition act but again there is a bill in the back of a law commission report which would reform both the extradition act and the mutual assistance in criminal matters act um, which would not deprive people like Mr Dotcom or Mr Kim who's also got a case in the Supreme Court but would mean that we protect their rights by actually having proper provisions designed to protect their rights rather than by having inefficient statutes 
which protect them by basically being so hopeless that it's very difficult indeed, as Mr. Dotcom has shown, for us to even get a timely hearing for an extradition matter, let alone to actually extradite him, even if that's what ultimately the minister decides. But we can talk about those other exciting and more reforms we go through the go through the, the next few podcasts. But I just want to thank Dean, Nessa and Eddie for those insights to what might happen next. Of course, we're not in charge of what happens next. Mr Hipkins, leader of the House, is in the New Zealand system responsible for what goes next. One of the oddities of New Zealand constitutional scheme, of course, is that we don't get to see the legislative programme. There is absolutely no reason, it seems to me, on God's earth why the people of New Zealand can't see what the government intends to do in terms of its actual legislative programme as opposed to what it says its legislative programme is. They could release that. So if Mr Hickman has made it to the end of this podcast, <laughs> my plea to him would be for him to publish when it's ready, the legislative programme for 2021, so we know what is actually going to go into Parliament before 2 o'clock on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays, where we sometimes find out what's going to be debated next Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. But thanks for that, and we'll um, huddle by our fireplace a little bit more, and um, hope you enjoyed what we've done so far, and we'll talk to you again soon. Cheers. <laughs>